you through the text. So our text for today is going to be in Matthew. Uh, the sermon title is Sheep Without a Shepherd. Sheep Without a Shepherd, and we're going to finish up Matthew chapter 9, beginning in verse 35. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and the villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful. But the laborers are few, therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Let's look at the first verse there, verse 35. Jesus went through all the cities and the villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease. So a person might be interested, uh, you might ask, well, what's the difference between a city and a village in those uh, archaic times a couple thousand years ago? Jesus went through all the cities and the villages. We know he's up in that northern area where the ten tribes were dispersed by Assyria. Uh, he's in the Galilee area. And when he says uh, cities and villages, what's the difference? Well, a city would have been a well-established, fortified a place that had walls around it. Uh, a village, on the other hand, would have been something on the outskirts that had no fortification and no walls. So it's interesting that they would have been that developed uh, back in those days. Uh, Josephus gives us a little bit of information regarding the area of Galilee, and apparently the area of Galilee had very fertile soil, so it was densely populated because people could grow stuff there. And so my understanding is they took good use of that, uh, and it was very heavily inhabited. Let me read to you here a little bit from Josephus, and he's speaking about Galilee, and he says, the cities are numerous, and there is a multitude of villages everywhere crowded with men owing to the fertility of the soil, so that the smallest of them contains above 15,000 inhabitants. So any of the smallest cities or villages had 15,000 people in it. I think that kind of adjusts the way I imagined the place being. Overall, uh, in other areas, Josephus says there's over 200 cities and villages, and the population was probably greater than 3 million people. Another interesting part about this section of text that we're in right now is if it, you may have had to keep your attention, but uh, I think I've told you before that authors in the Scriptures use different techniques to draw your attention to the beginning of a phrase or the end of a phrase, and I've told you about having bookends. Bookends is where the author will start a section with a particular phrase, and then the author will end that section with the exact same phrase. We've seen several of those in Romans. I think we've already had one here, but I want to show it to you. So this verse right here is the clue that Matthew is going to be ending this particular section and trans... Uh, tra <laughs> He's going to be... Uh, Transitioning, thank you. Transitioning into the next phrase. So uh, the phrase he just gave us was first said in chapter 4 and verse 23. You'll want to pay attention to these particular words, teaching, proclaiming, and healing. Uh, chapter 4 and verse 23, he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease. Today's text, we see the exact same phrase, which is going to close this section. Uh, Matthew 9.35, Jesus went through all the cities and villages. And then here's the repeated phrase, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. I think that's kind of cool, don't you? They uh, have these little cues. Uh, they were The Greeks were really striving hard in... Uh, exposition and oratory and writing. They weren't as developed as we are today, but they were trying really hard to give readers clues uh, 
when things were transitioning and changing. And there's your clue. I'd like to review just a little bit. Uh, between chapter 4 we and chapter 9, we had the sections uh, chapter 5 through 7, and that was the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus gave His preaching. The Sermon on the Mount, He challenged uh, the readers and He challenged His disciples to a much higher standard of righteousness. Uh, that, that section of Scripture was what I called Jesus is the new Moses. Because in that section of Scripture, chapter 5, Jesus goes up on the mountain. Jesus turns and He gives His uh, updated expectation of righteousness to all the people from the mountain. It's something similar to what Moses did. But what was interesting is Moses said, I mean, Jesus said, Moses said this, but I say this. Uh, you shall, you've heard it said, don't murder. But Jesus said, I say, don't even hate. Don't even be angry. You've heard it said, uh, don't commit adultery. But Jesus said, I'm telling you, keep your mind free from any kind of lust. Don't even have lustful thoughts. You've heard it said, an eye for an eye, and we did a good exposition on an eye for an eye. An eye for an eye, it wasn't a barbaric phrase. It was a gracious phrase that limited retribution. It was a phrase that limited the amount of damage that could be given back to a criminal. It has to be equal. If he bruised you, you're allowed to bruise him, but you're not allowed to do more than that. And so it was a, a phrase used, and he said, so you've heard that there are limits to your retribution. But Jesus said, but I tell you, be merciful. Don't even choose to get that limit of retribution. Uh, he says, show mercy because your Father is merciful, and then you'll really be sons of God. He says, then your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High because He is kind to the ungrateful and to the wicked. What a calling that we have to learn to manifest the mercy and the grace and the long suffering of God our Father. And he says, so that you can be called sons of God. Sons of God, because you look like your heavenly Father. That was chapters 5 through 7. Chapters 8 through 9 were the miracle sections. And what we said about chapters 8 through 9 is they match up with Isaiah chapter 8 and 9. The idea of Jesus' ministry in Galilee, Jesus bringing healing, Jesus bringing light, Jesus bringing joy to that northern area of Galilee was already promised back in Isaiah 9. But let me start out with Isaiah 8. In Isaiah 8, there is a warning to Israel, the northern ten tribes that eventually get destroyed. And the warning came through many prophets. And God said, you're being idolatrous. You're worshiping other gods. And that's not allowed. There's immorality going on amongst you. And that is not allowed. And so God sent prophet after prophet after prophet to that northern area to warn them to repent or else destruction was coming. And so chapter 8 talks about the destruction that is coming if you don't repent. And this is it right here, Isaiah 8.22. And they will look to the earth and behold distress and darkness and gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into a thick darkness. Chapter 8 was heavy because he was warning them, you need to make these changes or you will be thrust into thick darkness. But God, a loving, merciful God, doesn't leave Israel with that uh, idea of terror. In the very next verse of the next chapter, chapter 9 and verse 1, he promises that one day he'll come back and bring light to the same area that he brought gloom and darkness. And let's read uh, chapter 9 and verse 1. Here is the expectation, the promise after judgment. Isaiah 9, 1. But then there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. 
In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter times, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. Verse 2, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. And those who dwell in a land of deep darkness, on them a light has shone. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy, and they rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, and they are glad when they divide the spoils. What we see Jesus doing in His ministry in Galilee is God fulfilling His promise in Isaiah 9 that I won't leave you in gloom forever. I won't leave you in darkness forever. I won't leave you in a bad, broken state forever. One day I will come. I'll bring a light to the area of Galilee. I'll restore your joy. There will be rejoicing again in the land of Galilee. And this prophecy is fulfilled in Jesus' ministry. And that's why we don't see Jesus ministering in Jerusalem at the temple where we expect Him to be. He's up in no man's land. The reason He's focused on that area is because He's fulfilling this promise of Isaiah. And so now in our text, that's what Matthew has taught us, chapters 5 through chapter 9. And now He's bringing it to a close. He closes it with the bookends. And then he goes on and he adds one other phrase about Jesus' feeling towards this northern area that had once been destroyed. Uh, back to our text in verse 36. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless they were like sheep without a shepherd. This is really a heavy verse. It's a small verse, but it's just very heavy. Jesus' compassion for what he was seeing. I'd like to recount for just a moment. It says here that when he saw the crowds, I'd like to remind us that Jesus was always surrounded by crowds. It would be an interesting word study someday for you to go through the book of Matthew and look up every time that the book of Matthew says crowds. It's almost in every chapter in the book. But let me just give you a handful of the verses up to our present place in, in Matthew chapter 9. Let me give you a handful of the references Jesus attracted people. Jesus attracted large crowds. In chapter 4, we read great crowds followed Him. In chapter 5, seeing the crowds, He went up on the mountain. Chapter 7, and when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at His teaching. Chapter 8, when He came down from the mountain, there were great crowds that followed Him. Chapter 9, and when the crowds saw it, they were afraid and later again in chapter 9, the crowds marveled. Jesus had people's attention. Uh, I, I like to reflect on this. Uh, do you re realize that Jesus had a mega church? Jesus' ministry attracted people, and He had a mega church. The smallest of the villages was 15,000, is what Josephus says. And we know that there are times when Jesus feeds 5,000. We know that there's times when He feeds 3,000. And so we're talking thousands and thousands of people that were following Jesus. He had His own mega church. It's the next phrase where he says, the people, and when he looked out at this sea of people, it says that the people were harassed and helpless. I tried to do quite a bit of research on those words, and uh, it got pretty heavy and pretty deep. Things like people were broken, people were 
being misguided. People were without hope. I, I can't imagine what Jesus must have seen as he looked out at that group of people, but Matthew strikes compassion for the people that Jesus is ministering to. And he makes it known that Jesus Christ, God incarnate, the second person of the Godhead, looks out and he has compassion for these people. He has compassion for the fact that they need a leader. They need somebody to show them the way. They need someone to bind them up. And Jesus is sensitive to that. Now, I can't imagine what that would, would look like. Well, just now I got an image of uh, one of our missions in Peru, and I do have an image of what it would look like. Uh, we went out to some pretty poor places, but the, the analogy that I came up with, have you ever seen one of those uh, stray dog commercials where uh, people are asking money? And what do they do when they're showing you? What are you seeing when they ask you for money? They're, the First of all, they're playing sad music. And then you see some dog that's probably chained up. He's probably muddy. He's matted. He's wet. He's shivering. Probably has an open sore somewhere. And they know how to tug on those heartstrings. And so I, I, I wanted to do some kind of work for us to imagine Jesus looking at a group of people and feeling bad that they have no guidance in their life. Maybe some of us know some people that we feel bad, that it seems like they have no guidance. Uh, we wish better for someone, but we see someone just caught in bad judgment, uh, crazy expectations that are going to have to be reeled in, or someone that uh, feels like nothing I try works. I, I had a friend one time that said that would, uh, no, no, not a friend, I'm sorry. I rented a room when I lived in Eugene from a guy for a little while. And that poor guy, anytime anything went wrong, if he stubbed his toe, if he cooked rice and it came out bad, anytime something didn't work, he just said, nothing ever goes right for me. Just always downcast. Jesus recognized that these were people that had been abandoned, people that were worn out, mangled, exhausted, trying to do life right, but having no idea what it looks like to do life right. People were broken. I want to talk for just a minute about his phrase. They were like sh sheep without a shepherd. Sheep without a shepherd is a very common phrase. You could be turning to Numbers 27 if you'd like to look at one of these, Numbers 27. But sheep without a shepherd was a common phrase for the Israelite people when, number one, if they didn't have a prophet that was giving them God's words, it was a compassionate sight because the Scripture says they were like sheep without a shepherd. Anytime Israel uh, didn't have a good king, and Israel was suffering as a result of not having a good king, uh, the phrase would be, they were like sheep without a shepherd. It might be hard for us to draw that imagery because most of us probably aren't familiar, but I'm sure uh, a bunch of white sheep on a hillside versus, you know, when you see in the movies, uh, some guy is driving down a, a road in England and all the sheep are just pressed in tightly and kept together. But then you look at some example where all the sheep are just scattered all over the hillsides and you realize there's no way to reel them all in. Let me show you a couple of these. Uh, Moses, in Numbers 27, Moses gets concerned because God has just let him know that, Moses, I'm going to let you see the promised land, but I'm not going to let you enter the promised land because you sinned against me, Moses. You didn't regard me as holy in front of the congregation. Boy, there's some implications for us, aren't there? You didn't make me look like a holy, righteous God by your behavior. Because of your behavior, Moses, you have brought the God of creation into shame because of your behavior. So I can't let you enter the promised land, but I will let you see it, Moses. And so Moses, with the heart of a shepherd, says, well, 
Lord, I hope you'll raise somebody up then. I get, I get my destiny, I get it. But I hope that you'll raise someone up because I don't want Israel to be like sheep without a shepherd. Here it is, Numbers 27, 15. Moses spoke to the Lord saying, Let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, appoint a man over the congregation. Verse 17, who will go out before them and come in before them, who shall lead them out and bring them in so that the congregation of the Lord may not be as sheep that have no shepherd. Father God, raise somebody up to lead these people because when people don't have good leadership, when people aren't hearing spiritual words, it's devastating what that looks like. It looks like sheep with no shepherd. Another time, uh, one of the kings, King Ahaz, you can be looking at 1 Kings chapter 22 if you want to turn to that. One of the kings at the time was a very bad king and a prophet was sent to give him a warning and there was all kind of pressure put on the prophet to say something that I'm going to like to hear. But normally when God sends a prophet to a bad king, that king is not going to enjoy the message very much. And so after a little bit of sarcasm, the prophet here announces to King Ahaz, God is going to take you out of the picture. And as a result of Israel not having a king, they're going to be like Sheep without a shepherd. We'll look at it. 1 Kings 22 and verse 17. And he said, this is the prophet speaking to King Ahaz. And he said, I saw all of Israel scattered on the mountains as sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord said, these have no master let each one return to his home. This is the group of people. This is the group of people that had no good kings, that had no shepherd, that were scattered abroad on the mountains. This is the group of people that Jesus is now looking at in His ministry in Galilee. The same people that still didn't have good leadership. Now, one thing I'd like to point out, uh, these people were supposed to have leadership because there was a priesthood that had been installed under the Mosaic law. And the purpose of the priesthood was to teach people the difference between what's clean and what's unclean. To teach the congregation the difference between what's common and what's holy. To give people the understanding of the difference. You know, today, people still need that kind of teaching because people will engage in something with the best that they know. Don't we? I feel convinced that people try their best to live a good life. I mean, nobody sets out to go, I want my life to be as hard and horrible and brutal as possible, so I'm going to make as many mistakes as I can. I don't think people do that. I think people are genuinely trying to find the best course in life, but we've witnessed they're like sheep without a shepherd. They haven't had the training. They haven't been taught the difference between, no, don't do that because that is a common thing. You've been called to this because this is a holy thing. You've been called to live a righteous life. And God says, you know, people really don't know how to live a righteous, holy life because that is a spiritual thing. And you can only live a spiritual life if you've been born again. Uh, I can't remember the verse, but it says, born again uh, from a spiritual seed. A spiritual seed is something that comes out of the pulpit. A spiritual seed is a scripture that comes out of the Bible, but there is spiritual seed that needs to land in someone's heart. And now they can begin to challenge themselves to live uh, 
according to that spiritual seed, to some higher form of righteousness, a higher form of holiness. But most of the people that we encounter have never had one of those spiritual seeds land in their heart. And so they're living uh, what the Bible calls a common life, an unholy life. It's a shame, and that bothered Jesus because he saw people that were caught in that trap, and he had compassion for them. So Israel was supposed to have leadership. It was supposed to be the priesthood. The priesthood. Let me take you back. Look at Malachi. Malachi chapter 2. That's the last Old Testament book. And we're going to see that Malachi prophesied back I think this was about 400 years before Christ came. Malachi said the problem is God left priests to instruct people how to live holy, righteous, spiritual lives. But what happens when the priesthood, what happens when the spiritual leaders are not instructing people with real, holy, spiritual words? God says, I'm going to come do something about that. So let's follow that storyline. Shepherds that were not shepherding the flock. Malachi 2 and verse 7. The lips of a priest should guard knowledge and people should seek instruction from his mouth because he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But you, meaning the priesthood at the time, you have turned aside from the way, and you have caused many to stumble by your instructions. People need to have spiritual seeds planted in their life. Every Sunday and Wednesday night, the pulpit should be a place where you are always getting spiritual seed planted in your life. And it should challenge you because we're carnal, we're fleshly, we're creation. And God says, I'm not like you, I'm spirit. Your thoughts are not my thoughts, my thoughts are not your thoughts. So when somebody has the role of Speaking to the congregation, God says, use my words and say my words exactly the way I said them because Tony doesn't have much to offer you guys. But if I can crucify the flesh and get myself out of the way and just show you guys what God has said and say it exactly the same way He says it, you're getting a spiritual seed that could take root in your heart and it could change you. <clears throat> but the problem was the spiritual leaders were causing people to stumble because when people were looking for their instruction, they had turned away from the ways of God and they weren't giving people good instruction. And so Ezekiel 34, you can turn to that, Ezekiel 34, uh, God says, I'm going to come do something about that. I'm not going to allow uh, the spiritual leadership to mislead and misguide my people forever. So God says, I'm going to come do something about that. And, and we see it in Ezekiel 34 and verse 1. And the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, this is verse 1. Prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, thus saith the Lord God, Ah, shepherds of Israel, who have been feeding yourself, should not the shepherd feed the sheep? Verse 4. The weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the stray you have not brought back, and the lost you have not sought them. And with force and harshness you have ruled them. Verse 5, So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. Shepherd. 
Later on in this same chapter, Ezekiel 34, if we pick up in verse 11, God says, because he has compassion for his sheep, God says, I myself will come. I will come and I will shepherd my sheep. Verse 11. For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I, I myself will search for my sheep and I will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep that have been scattered, so I will seek out my sheep and I will rescue them from all the places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. You might put a reference here next to Ezekiel 34 and verse 11. As soon as God says, I myself will come search for my sheep, I would cross-reference yourself to our passage today, Matthew 9. And 36, because we witness God Himself, God in the flesh, seeing the crowds, having compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless. They were like sheep that didn't have a shepherd. God kept His promise to His people. I think one of the reasons that Jesus had compassion is because He came in the form of a man And Jesus had to come in the form of a man because when God spoke to His people the way a sovereign, divine God that has complete dominion over His creation, back in Deuteronomy, when God spoke from Mount Sinai, the people were terrified. God spoke from a a mountain that was on fire, a mountain that when any animal got too close to the mountain, it died immediately a mountain that had thunder and lightning. And the people said, it's terrifying to hear God's voice. Please don't let God speak to us anymore because He's so terrifying. And God says, that's a good thing that they asked that, Moses. Deuteronomy 18.18. So Moses, tell them that one day I'll send them a prophet that'll be like you, Moses. And he won't be so scary. He won't be fire and lightning, but he'll be like you. And and when you see him, it'll be just like seeing me. But he's going to be a gentle healer. He's going to be a teacher. He's going to be a preacher. He's going to restore joy and you'll rejoice. And that's what we're getting to witness. Matthew giving us an account of all of these things coming true. Well, 36 finishes up that last section. That's the bookend. But then we have verses 37 and 38, and these verses are strange. Uh, And they're kind of hard to interpret. So let's start with verse 37. Verse 37, Matthew chapter 9. And then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful. But the laborers are few. It's a strange passage. It's a difficult passage because Jesus has just been talking about fulfilling the promise to come shepherd the sheep. Jesus has been, uh, Matthew has been portraying Jesus as the good shepherd that brings joy and rejoicing to an area that was at one time full of gloom and darkness. He comes to bring light to the area that had one time been destroyed. And then all of a sudden he starts talking about harvest. Now, that's something that we're a little more familiar with because as we drive by some of the orchards, have you ever seen a great big sign in front of one of the orchards? Pickers needed. Pickers needed. The the trees are full of fruit and they're ripe and we need pickers. I wanted to offer to do that, but I, I ended up eating more of the fruit than, than what I put in the bag. Uh, there's a guy up here on, uh, I, if I remember right, on Gage. He's got the best peaches, man. Unbelievable peaches. George, oh, I'll keep it a secret because I don't want people going and picking the trees, but I have my secret source for good peaches. Okay, 
So he switches here, and uh, it sounds optimistic when you look at it, doesn't it? It sounds optimistic. The harvest is plentiful. There's tons of fruit, you guys. We just need people to go harvest it. We just need some laborers, some workers that are willing to go out and get it. Churches will tend to borrow from this. The harvest is plentiful. There's tons of people that are ready for the gospel. All we have to do is go out and get it. But if you've tried going out and harvesting, you've probably found that there isn't a lot of ripe fruit. There aren't a lot of people that we come across that uh, are hungry to be harvested. Uh, Mom and I just finished uh, doing our precinct evangelism, so we handed out over 400 door knockers, inviting them to our worship service, inviting them for Bible study, uh, wanting them to see the beautiful truths of God's Word, because as we go door to door, my mind is these are like harassed and helpless sheep, sheep without a shepherd. Lord, please put it on their heart to respond to your call. And we've put out over 400 of those, and we haven't heard yet. So that doesn't mean we're going to stop. That doesn't mean we're discouraged. We're going to go back and, and give them another door knocker in a few months, right? We're going to keep following up. But, but I'm just saying, wow, sometimes the verse makes it look optimistic, but our personal experience says it's a little bit harder. And so this verse... On the one hand, it does sound optimistic, but on the other hand, if you're familiar with the biblical idea of a harvest, the biblical idea of a harvest is that there will be some that will be saved, but there will be many that will be bound up and thrown into the fire. The biblical idea of a harvest is kind of it's about judgment. So let me read you a couple of these verses in case we're not familiar with the biblical view of harvest. Uh, turn to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 13, uh, there's a bit of a parable and some people want to go out and reap the harvest. They want to go out and bring in the wheat in this particular example. But as they're considering the wheat, they're looking out there and they're saying, hey, wait, Lord, something's wrong. There's a bunch of weeds that are mixed in with the wheat. And that's why God says, so we're going to hold off on the harvest because if you go out there and start pulling up the wheat right now, or if you go out there and start pulling up the weeds right now, you're going to end up yanking up a lot of the good wheat so sometimes we have to wait, the Scripture says, for the harvest. And look at what he says, Matthew 13 and verse 30. He says, For now let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I'll tell the reapers, gather the weeds first, bind them in a bundle to be burned. But gather the wheat and bring that into my barn. And we're left hanging in the balance as Matthew provides these two verses, 37 and 38. I feel a little bit of unrest, and maybe Matthew did that on purpose, but Matthew is using these verses to transition us into chapters 10 and 11, where Jesus is going to send out his disciples. And so we're left hanging in the balance here, wondering, should we be excited for the disciples? Is it going to be tons of fruit and they're going to go out and evangelize and, and reap a huge harvest and bring in a, a huge amount of fruit? Or should we be concerned about the disciples going out because there's going to be a lot of judgment, a lot of resistance, maybe people that are not receptive to the gospel. And we don't know which one to anticipate. Uh, we won't know until we start chapter 10 next week. I think that's what Matthew is doing here. He's leaving us not sure. So he says, here's what you do in the meantime. Here's what you do in the meantime. Back to Matthew 9, 38. 
Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Uh, Matthew kind of gives us a little bit of a delay before pushing us into the discipleship, pushing us into the harvest. And he says, for now, let's just pray that God will send some workers out to do the harvesting. And that's where we end up in chapter 9. Draws us to a close here, and we're in eager anticipation of chapters 10 and 11, wondering, is there going to be a bountiful harvest, or is there going to be resistance and trouble? I wanted to draw your attention to something right quick, because we've been talking about the sheep, Jesus as the good shepherd, Jesus coming to feed his sheep. Uh, Here's just a little bit, uh, every now and then in Scripture, you don't ever see the the theology of the Trinity, the Godhead, first, second, third person of the Godhead, God the Father, uh, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We don't see any particular Scripture that really gives us a theological primer on that subject. But sprinkled all throughout Scripture, there are places where God says, I'm going to do something. And the Scripture says, and Jesus came and did it. There are Scriptures that say, when God led Israel out of Egypt, but then in the New Testament it says, when Jesus led Israel out of Egypt. And so what we do see, and there's just enough there in the Scripture, there's just enough there where the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit overlap enough times There's just enough there to give a faithful, believing person all they need to know about the Trinity, about the Godhead. So let me just share with you one thing that I thought was neat as we draw this to a close. Go back to Ezekiel 34. Uh, Ezekiel 34, and I'm going to have you cross-reference a text there in Ezekiel Uh, and show you something very interesting. Here is another one of those places where God and Jesus overlap. So Ezekiel 34 and verse 30. Ezekiel 34 and verse 30. And they shall know, this is what we just read about God coming to heal His sheep. Verse 30, and they shall know that I am the Lord their God, with them that they, the house of Israel, are my people, declares the Lord God. This is Yahweh, Lord God, God of creation. Verse 31, and that you are my sheep. I would put a square around that. Put a square around you, Israel. You are my sheep. And this is Yahweh, the God of creation, speaking here. Human sheep of my pasture. And I am your God, declares the Lord God. That is Father God, the God of creation. Right there where it said, my sheep, in verse 31, I would cross-reference yourself to John chapter 21 and verse 17. Write a little note to yourself. You are my sheep, says the Lord God. Send yourself over to John 21, 17. And let's go ahead and turn there. After Yahweh, the God of creation, the Lord God of Israel has says, I am coming because you are my sheep. Jesus has now resurrected in John chapter 21. Jesus has resurrected. Jesus has been the good shepherd. Jesus has finished his ministry in Galilee. He's come to fulfill Isaiah 9 to bring joy and rejoicing and light to a place that was full of gloom and darkness. And he's done that. Even more than that, he's now resurrected from the dead. And this is one of my favorite scriptures to exposit, John chapter 21, because basically Jesus makes his... Disciples breakfast. I always thought it's interesting that John's gospel doesn't end at the resurrection. The resurrection is the climax of the gospel. But that's not where John chose to end his gospel. John chose to record as the last thing in his gospel, Jesus 
wanted to make breakfast for his disciples. So he made them breakfast, and there's something else that Jesus wanted to do. He wanted to know, he wanted Simon Peter to know that he was forgiven. But notice what he tells Simon in here in verse 17. And he said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said this for the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. I just think that that's just enough for you to see that God the Father says, these are my sheep. Jesus says, these are my sheep. Just one of those ways where we see God the Father and the Son overlapping each other. All right, that's our sermon, guys. Bless you guys. Uh, may the